Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to do a book haul for the month of December. Talk about all the books that I have brought into my library and there are a lot for the month of December. I had done a count and I lost it. I forgot what the number is, but there are a lot to get through. So I am going to start with the ones that are not part of my Pulitzer Prize project and then we'll pivot to ones that are part of it. If you are unfamiliar, I am trying to read every book that has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And I'm working my way through all of them. And somewhere along the way, I decided that if I can find affordable used copies of all of them, I would like to own copies of all of them. So I have been c accumulating a collection of them over time, and I got a bunch this month. But again, first we're going to talk about the ones that uh, are not part of the project, and some of them are a little bit adjacent to the project, but we'll cover those first, just in case those are the ones that you're really particularly interested in. I'm excited about all of these books. I think for the purposes of a book I'll revisit when I get around to that in a year, even if I haven't read a chunk of these, and I have actually read um, two of these books so far, um, and I had read one previously, I think this is a, a good solid bunch of books that I am happy to have in my library. So in my book hauls, I will cover a little bit about the book. I'll read the first, a little bit from the beginning of each book, and uh, we'll go from there. So the first book I want to talk about is The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer. I first discovered this book when it was on Publishers Weekly's Best Fiction Books of 2022. It is also a winner of the Giller Prize. I'll put a link to my video about the Publishers Weekly Best Fiction Books of 2022. Sorry, the light is doing a bit of a weird thing on the cover. It's fine. Um, this follows Baxter, who is a sleeping car porter, which you can probably guess from the title. It has a really beautiful cover, and it is published by Coach House Books. I should mention that. He is a sleeping car porter in 1929 trying to get by so he can save enough money to go to dentistry school. But that's not easy because Baxter is both black and queer. And the passengers on this train have a lot of power over whether or not Baxter gets in trouble. And if he gets written up, he will be fired. Each section of the book covers a location along the train line. And one of the things that was really exciting when I had a copy of this book and flipped through it is that day four is Calgary to Banff, and Banff is actually where Joel and I got married in Canada. So just a fun little fact for you right there. I'm really excited. I've heard a lot of very good things about this book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it, hopefully, sometime soon. Here is a little bit from the beginning of the book. Toronto to Winnipeg, Monday, 10.45 p.m. Eastern to Wednesday, 9.15 p.m. Central. 9.45 p.m. Standing next to his step box, Baxter Hovers. Immobile and elastic, ready to spring forward to lift a suitcase, dissect a timetable, point to the conductor, nod, lift more suitcases, now hat boxes, answer more questions, and nod, nod, nod. Trouser cuffs drag in the dust, shiny boot heels clap against the train station platform, a child runs toward an observation car, ribbons and cufflinks and tickets and goodbye letters swish to the ground. Hands reach toward him, grab at him for a lift up, grab his coat pocket, wave in his face. A sea swell of passengers spilling toward his car, a maelstrom of departure time panic. R.T. Baxter, dentist-to-be, man who longs to land scums and extract pathological third molars, standing here next to his train, caught in this hurricane, drowsy already. And that is The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer, the first of many books that I have brought into my library in the month of December. The next one is the first of the ones that I have already read, Flying Out of Space, Inspired by the Indecent Adventures of Patricia Highsmith by Grace Ellis and Hannah Templer. I'll link the Friday Reads video where I talked about this uh, down below if you would like a little bit more about it. I'm glad that I read this. I, this was one of the New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2022. It is obviously about Patricia Highsmith um, as she pivoted from being a comic book writer to being a serious writer specifically honing in on the events that may have inspired her to write the novel The Price of Salt, which was later renamed Carol and obviously inspired the movie named Carol. Um, and it's about the difficulties that she faced in getting it published um, and having it acknowledged as her book as well. I do think it doesn't go as deep as I would have liked it, but I'm really glad that I read it. I enjoyed this a lot. My library didn't have a copy and I figured that the only way I was going to, going to be able to read it would be to order a copy. So I did. Here it is. It is published by Abrams Comics Arts, uh, I believe a division called Shirley. And 
it doesn't really make sense to read a portion of the opening of this book. So I will just show you the opening of it instead. And I have already read it. It was definitely worth my time and I would recommend it to you. It's again, a beautiful edition of this book, very well put together for whatever that's worth. The next book is The Stone Angel by Margaret Lawrence. So a bunch of the Pulitzer books that I ordered came from Thrift Books and Thrift Books has a thing where once you earn a certain amount of points, you get a free book under a certain amount. And I have kind of been watching for an edition of this. So I hit the threshold and I had a sort of free book again under the certain dollar amount. And I found an edition of the Stone Angel that qualified for it. So I actually got this for free. It's something I've been keeping an eye out for a while. It was first brought to my attention because someone on the New York Times Book Review podcast brought it up and talked about it. And the way they talked about it and Margaret Lawrence really made me curious. So this is the second book in Lawrence's Manawaka series. But I'm going to start here anyway, because this is the book that they had talked about. And it's the one that really grabbed my attention. It is about a woman named Hagar Shipley, who escapes from her nursing home and reflects on her life. As the back of the book says, uh, quote, her thoughts evoke not only the rich pattern of her past experience, but also the meaning of what it is to grow old and come to terms with mortality. I am really looking forward to reading it. And this edition is published by Chicago University Press. And here is a bit from chapter one of The Stone Angel. Above the town, on the hill brow, the stone angel used to stand. I wonder if she stands there yet, in memory of her who relinquished her feeble ghost as I gained my stubborn one, my mother's angel that my father bought in pride to mark her bones and proclaim his dynasty, as he fancied forever and a day. That is The Stone Angel by Margaret Lawrence. Really looking forward to that one as well. I, I, you can probably assume that I'm looking forward to reading all of these books, but I'm probably going to keep saying it anyway. The next three books are kind of linked together. They are all by Nao Marsh. My neighbors had recommended Nao Marsh to me because if you follow along, you know, I'm kind of dissatisfied with the current state of mystery thrillers. So I tend to go back and default to classic whodunits. My neighbors had recommended Nao Marsh since uh, I tend to, I, I, I sort of love the idea of Agatha Christie books, although I'm very up and down about the quality of them. And these books proclaim she writes better than Christie. So they had recommended them and I sort of kept my eye out for, uh, I wanted to go in order. So the first book of the series, is, the detective is Roderick Allen. Uh, the first one is A Man Lay Dead. Then there is Enter a Murderer. And then the third book is The Nursing Home Murders. They were all like a dollar at my local used bookstore. Uh, they had gotten a whole shipment of Nao Marsh books. So I picked up the first three. I have already read A Man Lay Dead and I will probably be talking about it at some point soon. Uh, I am, I thought it was a bit wild, but there was enough quality there that I will definitely continue with the next two and maybe continue on with some further books in the series as well from there. So two of these are by Jove and uh, A Man Lay Dead and The Nursing Home Murder, which is like a wild thing. And then uh, Enter a Murderer is a Berkeley edition as well. It says it's large print, but the type is like normal sized. So that's just an interesting thing. So in A Man Laid Dead, Inspector Allen is introduced as he investigates a death at a high society party in Enter a Murderer. Inspector Allen goes to the theater and witnesses an actor get shot and killed by a real gun on stage. And the nursing home murder seems to promise something different in the title, but the jacket seems to describe political intrigue after the home secretary dies on an operating table. So those all kind of link together. I've already read the first one and I'm hoping to get to the other two soon. Uh, this was just, a, I read this in basically a day and I fully anticipate that the other two will be very much the same. They're just kind of fun little entertainments on the side. The next book is the final one before we get into the actual Pulitzer books. And it is sort of adjacent to my Pulitzer Prize project. I already talked about it when I did my Pulitzer Prize deep dive on Josephine Johnson, who won a Pulitzer Prize for her novel now in November. I'll link that video down below if you would like to check it out. It's Seven Houses, A Memoir of Time and Places by Josephine W. Johnson. So obviously this is a memoir. I had been curious to seek it out because I wanted to know if 
there was anything in here about her writing career. It, it, it is an interesting structure for a memoir because it focuses on the places in which she lived at different parts of her life and then kind of spins out into a little bit more personal there. It actually keeps the reader at arm's length. As much as it's inviting the reader in to get to know her and her story, it definitely keeps you at arm's length and it doesn't reveal a whole lot about her or her uh, inner workings and what she may or may not have been thinking at any given time. But I did, I'm glad I got it. I did read it already. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I have it. One thing that is interesting, when you order a used book online, you don't always really know what you're going to get. Now, this book came in the condition in which it was advertised. But the surprise for me is that when I opened it up, there are two cards that say, this is an advanced copy from Simon & Schuster, Inc., the publishers would appreciate observance of this release date and two copies of your review. And it has the price of the book, the release date, and information about the publisher. So this is actually an advanced reader's copy, although it is an actual hardcover copy of the book. So when I saw this, I thought that was really cool. And then as I was thinking about it, it occurred to me, well, if this is an actual copy of the book, I wonder if it is a first edition. And sure enough, when I turned to the copyright page, it is the first printing of this book. Now, obviously, it's not in, like, great condition. And it's probably not really worth much to people other than me. But I thought that was really cool and a total surprise because it was not in the description of the book when I ordered it. Um, so that was a lovely surprise. And because I feel so connected to Josephine Johnson at this point, it, it just was a lovely surprise. And it doesn't probably doesn't mean much to anyone else other than me. So I it, it meant a great deal. The opening of the book is, At midnight in the darkness of New Year's Eve, I struck a match and lit a candle. A candle of many colors, rose and purple, sun yellow and blue, made by a child. Colors of such beautiful translucence that a rainbow seemed burning in the room. It was dark in the kitchen, a cave sheltering the candlelight. Outside, in the cold night, there were gunshots, celebrating the new year, the sound of a siren, and then silence. And that is Seven Houses, A Memoir of Time and Places by Josephine Johnson. And I have already read this one as well. So, so far of the ones we've covered, I've already read two of these books, which is really not bad. Now we start getting into the... Pulitzer books. And the first one I want to talk about is American Pastoral by Philip Roth. And again, because I ordered a lot of books, including Seven Houses came from Thrift Books. Um, this was another free one, I believe. I actually, no, I think I got a bunch of free ones from Thrift Books. I think this was one of them. And then there's one more as we work our way through. So this is American Pastoral by Philip Roth. This is an edition from Vintage. I'm going to read the blurb from the back of the book to give you a sense of what it is about. This was a Pulitzer Prize winner from the 90s. As the American century draws to an uneasy close, Philip Roth gives us a novel of unqualified greatness that is an elegy for all our century's promises of prosperity, civic order, and domestic bliss. Roth's protagonist is Swede Lavav, a legendary athlete at his Newark High School who grows up in the booming post-war years to marry a former Miss New Jersey, inherit his father's glove factory, and move into a stone house in the idyllic hamlet of Old Rimrock. And then one day in 1968, Swede's beautiful American luck deserts him. For Swede's adored daughter, Mary has grown from a loving, quick-witted girl into a sullen, fanatical teenager, a teenager capable of an outlandishly savage act of political terrorism. And overnight, Swede is wrenched out of the longed-for American pastoral and into the indigenous American berserk. Compulsively readable, propelled by sorrow, rage, and a deep compassion for its characters, this is Roth's masterpiece. I have read some Philip Roth books, and I, did, I started and did not finish The Human Stain. I have had better luck with some of his lesser-known books. Like, I enjoyed uh, Nemesis, and I, I can't remember the name of the other one. Uh, it was one of his more recent books. Um, so this will be an interesting one to try as part of my Pulitzer Prize project, and I'll be getting to it at some point. I don't know if I have plans to try to do it in 2023, but it will definitely be an interesting one whenever I do get around to it. And this is actually interesting because... This is where sometimes ordering books online where you can't see them uh, from used retailers, it's not in great condition. And part of me was a little bit miffed by that. It said it was in very good condition, but it looks like a little bit more like good condition to me. But these are kind of nebulous 
descriptions. So I feel like I could have gotten something from my local used bookstore that would have been in better condition. But, you know, it's fine. It's fine. I got it for free, so I'm not going to complain about it. But uh, that is just the dice you roll when you order a used book online. Part one is called Paradise Remembered, and here is a bit from the opening of American Pastoral. The Swede. During the war years when I was still a grade school boy, this was a magical name in our Newark neighborhood, even to adults just a generation removed from the city's old Prince Street ghetto and not yet so flawlessly Americanized as to be bowled over by the prowess of a high school athlete. The name was magical, so was the anomalous face. Of the few fair-complexioned Jewish students in our preponderantly Jewish public high school, none possessed anything remotely like the steep-jawed, insentient Viking mask of this blue-eyed, blonde born into our tribe as Seymour Irving Lavav. That is from the opening of American Pastoral by Philip Roth, the first of my many Pulitzer Prize books in this haul. And this is another interesting case. It's The Way West by A.B. Guthrie, another Pulitzer Prize winner. So this also said it was in very good condition, and something has chewed on the cover of this book. I don't know if you can see because the light is a little bit weird. But uh, yeah, so the quality can vary pretty wildly. But there was also a nice surprise here because, let me just double check it by going to the copyright page. This is a first printing. So this is a first edition of the book. So on the one hand, it's not in the condition that I had kind of hoped and the pages are kind of dirty here. But it's a first edition. So that was a fun surprise. The condition was a bit of a, you know, not so nice surprise. But here it is. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner. I'm going to read it at some point. This is uh, an edition from William Sloan Associates. This brings to life the adventures of the Western Passage and the Pioneer Spirit. It is a sequel to a book called The Big Sky. This celebrated novel charts a frontiersman's return to the untamed West in 1846. Dick Summers, as pilot of a wagon train, guides a group of settlers on the difficult journey from Missouri to Oregon. It is in sensitive but unsentimental prose, Guthrie illuminates the harsh trials and resounding triumphs of pioneer life. With the way west, he pays homage to the grandeur of the western wilderness, its stark and beautiful scenery, and its extraordinary people. It is a book that I'm really looking forward to uh, as part of my Pulitzer Prize project, and I have a first edition now, so that's a nice surprise, no matter how you look at it. And there's a picture of A.B. Guthrie on the back of the book. Let's read a little bit from the opening. It is dedicated to Harriet and Chapter 1. The day dawned clear, but it had, it had rained the night before, the sudden squally rain of middle March. Taking a look out the kitchen door, seeing the path lead down to the muddy barnyard and the tracks of his shoe packs splashed in it, Ligi Evans was just as well satisfied that things were wet. It gave him an excuse not to work, even if he could be mending harness or fixing tools. Not that he minded work, it was just that he didn't feel like working today. That is the beginning of The Way West, another Pulitzer Prize winner, this one by A.B. Guthrie, and it is a sequel. I don't have a copy of The Big Sky. I will. It'll be easy enough to get, because I, I don't know if A.B. Guthrie himself is a Montana author, but you can find his books in any Montana bookstore. So uh, I believe my local used bookstore has lots of copies of The Big Sky, so I will probably be picking one up there. Um, as an addendum to my Pulitzer Prize project, because in cases where a book that won a Pulitzer Prize is a follow-up to another book, I would like to read the book that it is a follow-up to. And I'm not going to force myself to read books uh, that are sequels that were published later, because they would not have been published when the book won the Pulitzer Prize. But since they would have existed when the book did win the Pulitzer Prize, that's kind of the way I'm thinking about it. So I still need to get a copy of The Big Sky, but I do have The Way West. And again, kind of a mixed bag in that the condition is not great, but it is a first edition. And it is a sort of handsome edition of the book anyway. So uh, what can you do about that? And then there's another interesting case. So I ordered what I what was advertised as a Franklin Library edition of So Big by Edna Ferber. And when it came, it looks like a Franklin Library edition, but is not. It is an inter international collector's library edition of the book, which is kind of fine, but it's not what I thought I was ordering. And I'm trying to get the Franklin Library edition of Pulitzer Prize winners whenever I can, whenever they're affordable and for the ones where they exist. So I did contact Thrift Books and they told me I can keep this and they gave me a credit, which I then used 
to get an actual Franklin Library edition of So Big by Edna Ferber. So now I actually have two copies, and I don't know what... Uh, I'll probably read the International International Collector's Library version, um, just to keep the Franklin Library one looking nice. Um, they are both in good condition, and... Uh, yeah, so the customer service was really nice on that. I can't can't complain. Um, so ultimately, I did get the Franklin Library edition that I wanted. And again, I apologize, the light is doing weird things. But it's kind of nice because you do get to see the gilt shining. And that kind of lets you know why I like these Franklin Library editions of the books so much whenever possible. So I'm going to show you the illustrations because every Franklin Library edition has illustrations in it as well. And so, So Big was the winner for 1925. Here is the first illustration in the book. Hopefully you can see with, again, the light doing kind of a weird thing and shining through the ring light. <laughs> but anyway, uh, in So Big, this is the story of Selena Peak, who moves from the big city to a farming community after becoming an orphan at age 19. Her natural curiosity clashes with a woman's traditional role in society, but she marries, raises a son, and wonders if he will retain her values after he heads off into the world on his own. I have never read an Edna Ferber book I've heard good things about. She also wrote Giant, which was turned into the movie Giant, and I'm very much looking forward to reading one of her books at some point, hopefully soon. So let's do a bit from the opening of So Big. Chapter 1. Until he was almost 10, the name stuck to him. He had literally to fight his way free of it. From So Big, of fond and infantile derivation, it had been condensed into So Big, and so big to Zhang, in all its consonantal disharmony, he had remained until he was a 10-year-old schoolboy in that incredibly Dutch district southwest of Chicago, known first as New Holland and later as High Prairie. At 10, by dint of fists, teeth, copper-toed booths, and temper, he earned the right to be called by his real name, Dirk de Jong. Now and then, of course, the nickname bobbed up and had to be subdued in a brief and bitter skirmish. His mother, with whom the name had originated, was the worst offender. And that is the opening of So Big by Edna Ferber. Really looking forward to that one. And then we had another surprise. Like a pleasant supplies, surprise from uh, ordering from thrift books. This is A Bell for Adano by John Hersey. And you can see it's another Franklin Library edition. And the light, while casting kind of a weird shadow because of the ring light, uh, does really show off the gilt very nicely. So the surprise with this one is that it actually has a little booklet inside, which is notes from the editors. And it actually kind of explains the history behind the story of this book and what inspired John Hersey to write it. John Hersey is also known for nonfiction books, uh, perhaps most notably a book called Hiroshima about World War II. And um, this is signed by John Hersey. I, I'm trying to put it into a place where you can actually see his signature. There you go. And it didn't say that when I ordered it. So what a nice surprise about this book. So there are definitely pitfalls to ordering a used book online that you can't see in person, but what a nice surprise. I now have a signed edition of A Bell for Adano by John Hersey. And this booklet that it came with is going to be very helpful when I do get around to this for my Pulitzer Prize project, because that will provide some invaluable information for me uh, in crafting my Pulitzer Prize deep dive on this book, which I think will be interesting. So this is about an Italian-American major during World War II who wins the love and admiration of the local townspeople when he searches for a replacement for the 700-year-old town bell that had been melted down for bullets by fascists. Really looking forward to this book as well. Again, John Hersey is mostly known for nonfiction, uh, so this will be an interesting case as well. There is the opening illustration. They have a different illustrator for each Franklin Library edition, and that is just a beautiful uh, il illustration. Uh, this is a particularly nice uh, Franklin Library edition. Chapter 1. Invasion had come to the town of Adano. An American corporal ran tautly along the dirty Via Favemi, and at the corner he threw himself down. He made certain arrangements with his light machine gun and then turned and beckoned to his friend to come forward. In the Via Calabria, in another part of town, a party of three crept forward like cats, 
An explosion, possibly of a mortar shell, at some distance to the north, but apparently inside the town, caused them to fall flat with a splash of dust. They waited on their bellies to see what would happen. And let me see if I can find another illustration in this one, because that first one uh, from the opening of the book was particularly beautiful, and this is not going to disappoint either. I love these editions of these books, so I, that's why I love to have them whenever I can. The next one is another one that I got for free. And again, you can see the uh, differences in quality. This is a book that was described as very good condition, and it actually, to me, looks like very good condition. It's The Optimist's Daughter by Eudora Welty. Another one. I've never read a Eudora Welty book, and I am very much looking forward to this. It is a vintage edition of this book, published by Vintage, not a vintage edition of it. I'm going to read the blurb from the back for you. The Optimist's Daughter is the story of Laurel McKelva Hand, a young woman who has left the South and returns years later to New Orleans, where her father is dying. After his death, she and her silly young stepmother go back still farther to the small Mississippi town where she grew up. Alone in the old house, Laurel finally comes to an understanding of the past, herself, and her parents. Those are topics that are very dear to me, and I'm very interested in right now. So I... I'm kind of thinking that I would like to read this one in 2023, but I already have prioritized some other books for my Pulitzer Prize project in my mind. Maybe I'll get to this one. Maybe I won't. But I am very much looking forward to it regardless. Let's do a bit from the opening. Chapter 1. A nurse held the door open for them. Judge McKelva going first, then his daughter Laurel, then his wife Faye. They walked into the windowless room where the doctor would make his examination. Judge McKelva was a tall, heavy man of 71 who customarily wore his glasses on a ribbon. Holding them in his hand now, he sat on the raised, throne-like chair above the doctor's stool, flanked by Laurel on one side and Faye on the other. That's the opening of The Optimist's Daughter by Eudora Welty. Very much looking forward to that one. The next one is another Franklin Library edition. We got some chunky ones <laughs> coming up. This is Advice and Consent by Alan Drury. And actually, this was a book that uh, somebody had mentioned would probably be a, an interesting follow-up to Now in November um, as a Pulitzer Prize deep dive because it deals with accusations of communism and Josephine Johnson's career may have been sidelined by accusations of communism. So uh, I'm thinking about it. I don't know if it's going to be the next one that I do, but it that is an interesting corollary. So I'm going to be kind of thinking about it. And again, it, it is this lovely Franklin Library edition of the book. Published in 1959, Advise and Consent uses plot elements that would have felt ripped from the headlines to an audience of the time, telling a story of political intrigue in which a nominee for Secretary of State faces accusations of communism. And let's find the opening illustration for this book. It, it was a massive bestseller at the time. It was turned into a movie of the same name. I forget who starred in it. Uh, there is the opening illustration. Let me see if I can find another one just for fun. Oh, it looks like there's a, an illustration at the opening of chapter or part three, Brigham Anderson's book. There's that. Now let's do a bit from the beginning of Advise and Consent. Ooh, it has a cast of characters in the beginning, which lets you know there will be a lot of people in this book. Chapter one. When Bob Munson awoke in his apartment at the Sheraton Park Hotel at 7.31 in the morning, he had the feeling it would be a bad day. The impression was confirmed as soon as he got out of bed and brought in the Washington Post and Times Herald. President names Leffingwell Secretary of State, the headline said. What Bob Munson said, in a tired tone of voice, was, Oh, God damn. And that is the opening of Advise and Consent by Alan Drury. So, the next one was also a bit of a surprise. Guard of Honor by James Gould Cousins. The reason this one is a surprise is that I believe this is a first edition. And again, that wasn't advertised when I ordered it. And it was a pretty reasonable price. Yes, this is a first edition of Guard of Honor by James Gould Cousins, another Pulitzer Prize winner. Guard of Honor balances a vast cast of intricately enmeshed characters as they react over the course of three tense days to a racial incident on a U.S. Air Force training base in Florida in 1942. Should be an interesting book. Another really chunky one. There is a photo of the author on the back. Let's do a bit from the opening of this book because I'm running a little long and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. Chapter one is called Thursday. 
Through the late afternoon, they flew southeast, going home to Okinawa at about 200 miles an hour. Inside the Spick and Span fuselage, the plane was a new twin-engined advanced trainer of the type designated AT-7, this speed was not noticeable. Though the engines steadily and powerfully vibrated and time was passing, the shining plane seemed stationary, swaying gently and slightly oscillating, a little higher than the, than the stationary dull crimson sphere of the low sun. That's the opening of Guard of Honor by James Gould Cousins, another Pulitzer Prize winner. We have four more, so bear with me. I know this is running a little bit long, and we have another. This is the final Franklin Library edition. It's Years of Grace by Margaret Ayer Barnes. What a beautiful spine. What beautiful detail on the front and the back of the book. Let's find the illustration at the beginning. I These have a sort of dreamlike quality to them, which makes them pretty beautiful as well. Here's another one from later in the book. The story, beginning in the 1890s and continuing into the 1930s, chronicles the life of Jane Ward Carver from her teens to age 54. The novel follows many of the same themes as Barnes's other works, centering on the social manners of upper-middle-class society. Her female protagonists are often traditionalists, struggling to uphold conventional morality in the face of changing social climates. A lot of books in the early history of the Pulitzer Prize are concerned with changing social um climates so that's a uh, very on brand for uh the the first few years of the pulitzer although i can't remember when this one was published it is the winner for let me see if i can find it of course as i want to the year i can't find it uh 1931 so yes it is definitely an early winner of the pulitzer prize for fiction and right in that era when uh such concerns were uh of key importance to the pulitzer board chapter one Little Jane Ward sat at her father's left hand at the family breakfast table, her sleek brown pigtailed head bent discreetly over her plate. She was washing down great mouthfuls of bacon and eggs with gulps of too hot cocoa. She did not have to look at the great black clock surmounted by the bronze bird that had stood on the dining room mantelpiece ever since she could remember to know that it was 20 minutes after eight. And that is the beginning of Years of Grace by Margaret Ayer Barnes. All right, we have three more. Next is The Reavers by William Faulkner. This is a uh, an edition published by Vintage. This was William Faulkner's last novel. It actually won him his second Pulitzer Prize for fiction. He is one of only four people to have won two Pulitzer Prizes for fiction, and this one was awarded posthumously. From what I've seen, this is unlike a lot of his other books. Um, it is a picaresque novel that tells of three unlikely car thieves from rural Mississippi. 11-year-old Lucius Priest is persuaded by Boone Hagenbeck, one of his family's retainers, to steal his grandfather's car and make a trip to Memphis. The priest's black coachman, Ned McCaslin, stows away and the three of them are off on a heroic odyssey, for which they are ill-equipped, that ends at Miss Reba's bordello in Memphis. From there, a series of wild misadventures ensues involving horse smuggling, trainmen, sheriff's deputies, and jail. This will be an interesting one because it's sort of the culmination of William Faulkner's career. Obviously, since it is his last novel, it was awarded posthumously, and it will be interesting from that perspective. So, I've only read one Faulkner novel, and it was uh, late in August. Chapter 1. Grandfather said, This is the kind of a man Boone Hagenbeck was. Hung on the wall, it could have been his epitaph, like a Bertillon chart or a police poster. Any cop in North Mississippi would have arrested him out of any crowd after merely reading the date. That is the opening of The Reavers by William Faulkner. The second to last one is The Mambo Kings Play Songs of Love, a much more recent winner of the Pulitzer Prize. This is by Oscar Hijuelos, and this edition is published by Perennial Library. Uh, it's from the 1990s. I can't remember when. Uh, it looks like it was published in 1989, so it, it would probably be the 1990 winner of the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It is about the lives of two Cuban brothers and musicians, Cesar and Nestor Castillo, who immigrate to the United States and settle in New York City in the early 1950s. The book chronicles Caesar's last hours as he sits in a seedy motel room, drinking and listening to recordings made by his band, the Mambo Kings. They had two editions of this book. There was a 20th anniversary edition, and I did not like the cover of that one, so I went with this one. It came from my local used bookstore, not from Thrift Books. And I am excited to read this one at some point. Here is the opening. 
It was a Saturday afternoon on LaSalle Street years and years ago when I was a little kid, and around three o'clock, Mrs. Shannon, the heavy Irish woman and in her perpetually soup-stained dress, opened her back window and shouted out into the courtyard, Hey, Cesar, you who, I think you're on television. I swear it's you. That's the opening of The Mambo Kings Play Songs of Love by Oscar Hijuelos. The final book, the final Pulitzer Prize winner, is The Stories of John Cheever. This is an edition from Knopf. I have actually read this. I don't know what happened to my edition. I had a paperback of it. Don't know where it is. So I have been looking forward to getting another copy of it, but I've been holding off. And then I was in my local used bookstore um, yesterday, actually, and saw this on the shelf and I had not been planning to get a hardcover edition of it. However, it was $7 and I had credit, so I did it. And I remember really loving this book a lot. This is a collection of stories that were written throughout John Cheever's career, and they were collected into one volume, which won the Pulitzer Prize. He is not the only person who has won a Pulitzer Prize off of previously published material like that, um, but it will be an interesting case for a Pulitzer Prize deep dive. I remember really loving the stories, so this will be an interesting one to revisit at some point. Probably odd to read just the beginning of a short story, but that's what we're going to have to do. So the first story is called Goodbye My Brother, and it opens... We are a family that has always been very close in spirit. Our father was drowned in a sailing accident when we were young, and our mother has always stressed the fact that our familial relationships have a kind of permanence that we will never meet with again. That is the opening from the opening story of the stories of John Cheever, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and uh, there he is. Nice hardcover edition of it for my collection. So those are the many, many books that I brought into my library in the month of December. There are a lot of them. I didn't do a count, but uh, there are a lot. And I, I I stand by them, though. I think this is a good collection of books. I've already read a chunk of them. Uh, I had already read the stories of John Cheever, and I've read uh, one of the Nao Marsh books. I read uh, Seven Houses, and I read Flung Out of Space. So I've read three of them already, and I had previously read a fourth, and I just need to reread it for my Pulitzer Prize project some point. So those are what I brought in. I'd love to hear your thoughts about any of these books or about anything else that you know inspired recommendations based on them, whatever. Let me know in the comment section down below. I will leave it at that since we're running a bit long. And uh, as always, I really appreciate your time and I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.